Rob, thank you for joining us on Building Belmont. And you are someone, I think when I say Building Belmont, you've been Building Belmont for a long time. So tell me about your background, ultimately what you do. Sure. I, uh, my name is Rob Presley. I'm president of a company called Cowell Banker Commercial Mecca. We are a Charlotte-based company. We have three offices. We have one in Charlotte, one in Belmont, and one in Rock Hill, South Carolina. We have strategically positioned ourselves over the last 15 years or so to uh, go into communities that we feel like we can have some positive impact, and uh, Belmont was a no-brainer for us. Uh, about um, 16 years ago, 15, 16 years ago, uh, my um, wife, uh, had lived in Belmont previously coming here from Phoenix, Arizona, and we had three small children and she really wanted to get out of Charlotte and move to a smaller community where they could grow up and be part of the community. And being active down here uh, and in the middle of developing uh, Eagle Park, which is a neighborhood here in Belmont, I uh, fell in love with Belmont too. And uh, had an opportunity uh, about that time to acquire one of the old Stowe homes in downtown. And uh, uh, after con convincing, uh, my wife uh, ended up talking me into buying this uh, 1920s uh, English Tudor on three and a half acres in the middle of town. And it was a little slice of paradise. And for us, it was, uh, gave us an opportunity to get out of um, Charlotte, where I spend most of my days working and come home in the evening. I, mm -hmm. I, I still look back on those days fondly, uh, crossing over the river at night and feeling some sense of peace as I uh, got out of the fray and, and, and drove into Belmont. Uh, but it was, it was um, I, I believe in life, things happen for a reason. Um, uh, serendipity comes into play and uh, it was the right place for us at the right time. Uh, I've ultimately moved back to Charlotte, as has my uh, uh, wife and daughters, and uh, um, that was a little bit strategic, but um, it's uh, our memories of here were fond. Um, I may have moved back to Charlotte, but I still spend an incredible amount of time in Belmont yeah. because that love for Belmont didn't leave with me departing and going back to Charlotte. Yeah. Um, it's. Um, it's an amazing community, and I could see very early on all that it could be. Uh, we're a, a community that is in transition. It was a city that was built on textiles that, uh, for the most part, no longer exist in Belmont. Most of those jobs and businesses have uh, since left, and like most manufacturing, has made its way overseas to other markets. But uh, the legacy's here, the memories are here, there are a, a lot of um, uh, people in this community who care very much about it. Mm -hmm. uh, at times there's dissension upon what we should do in the way of growth. Uh, and I have explained to uh, anybody that listened to me, growth's coming. Whether we want it or not, growth's coming to Belmont. And we can, we can let it happen or we can be involved and, and allow it to occur in a way that's beneficial to the community. And I think that, I think that we have done a good job of that up to this point, and I think that uh, much more growth's headed this way. Well, in talking before we started recording, I wish we would have recorded before, you talked about balanced growth, and you're someone, even just then, you mentioned legacy, you mentioned history, preserving that, but also looking at what it can be. What, what has that balance looked like in your experience with some of the projects that you've been involved in, or even just your philosophy in developing as a whole, preserving the legacy, honoring the legacy, while also progressively moving forward in controlling the growth or ensuring that there's balanced growth moving forward. So what has that philosophy been? How, how does a person do that to not leave Belmont being a bunch of strip malls or something like that, but it honors the legacy while looking forward? How have you done that in your career? Well, I, um, uh, early in my career, I, I just celebrated my 29th year at the company. It's a family business. My grandfather started the company uh, in the 50s by acquiring real estate. My uh, father took over, left corporate America and took over the business in 1980 when my grandfather passed away. And uh, my, uh, I remember going into my father's office one day. Uh, we were very involved in redeveloping existing properties as opposed to building new uh, new construction. Uh, Dad's claim to fame is his efforts in South End over a 20 year period, which as you know is a successful, probably one of the most successful neighborhoods in the Carolinas. Um, 
I went into dad's office one day. We were, he hired me in 1992 to help redevelop the Atherton Mill, which sits in the middle of South End. And it was the first project to kick off. South End was a very, uh, at the time, very blighted neighborhood. Uh, about half the buildings were unoccupied. Um, crime was a problem. And dad saw a vision, saw it could be something better. And it started with preserving the legacy of that neighborhood. That neighborhood was Charlotte's first industrial district. And his belief was, is we could take these, these old historic mill buildings and turn them into something that provided new life and save the history and instead of erasing it, preserve it and celebrate it. And I remember going into dad's office one day, uh, it was at the, 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 the heyday of drugstores being built on every corner and developers were making a lot of money building drugstores on every corner around the United States. And I went into dad's office one day and I said, dad, uh, I think that uh, what we're doing in preserving the history and the old buildings is great, but I think we need to diversify and I think that uh, we can make a lot of money uh, by building drugstores and other new retail. Uh, and he chuckled and laughed and he, his response was, um, uh, right now I'm driving the wagon and this is what we're doing. And when it's your turn, you can drive the wagon and you can develop all the 12,000 square foot boxes on the corners of Maine and Maine <laughs> you want to. And I chuckled and funny enough, here I am, he's retired and I'm preserving old buildings and giving them new life. Yeah. And so I think it was uh, somewhat instilled in me during my early career that uh, there is a way to develop real estate thoughtfully and there is a way to just do it for the money. Mm -hmm. And what I have realized in these last 29 years is you can, you can make money and give back to the community at the same time. Is that rare to develop thoughtfully? I mean, if you were to look at developers as a whole, as a, a sector, how many of them think like that in their development? I think that, uh, I, I think it's, I, I, that's an interesting question because uh, there was a time where I don't think anybody really cared. I think it was a very small portion of developers who really cared about um, um, giving lots of thought to the community and what is this going to do short term and long term. I, I think that's changed over time and I, I think that part of it's the popularity of the urban uh, infill neighborhoods. Um, I mean if you, it's easy to go to Charlotte, you go to any, any uh, urban uh, in, uh, former industrial district and now that they have life, they have apartments and they have restaurants and they have shops and they have local businesses. And so I think that the, the number of people developing thoughtfully has grown. Uh, our society has changed. Um, I, I think we are more considerate of what it is we're leaving behind. And I think municipalities have uh, done a good job of forcing developers to be more thoughtful. If you want to do this in our community, then you're going to do so in a way that leaves us with something that we can be proud of. Well, you mentioned before going into developing and not buying, developing, selling, getting out, going from one pocket to another. You truly are invested and invested in the community and its success and what overall serves the community, right? Being a conduit for service. And I think that leans into our conversation, what we want to talk about today, which is the Belmont Trolley. Sure. So talk about honoring the past and what could have been and how it serves the community because you're involved in a lot of projects right now. You could have done anything, but still investing the time and spending the time to bring back the Belmont Trolley and bring back most people. I didn't know the Belmont Trolley was ever a thing. I was wondering what these tracks were here. Uh, what, what was the catalyst for that, bringing the Belmont Trolley back and restoring it and honoring that legacy and serving Belmont in that True. way? Well, Belmont's been on this, this uh, pattern of growth and evolution uh, over the last 30 years. and. I moved here about 15 years ago and had an opportunity to live in downtown with three young daughters and uh, came here for the same thing that a lot of other people came for. But as a developer, I started to realize that we're at a, we're at a pivotal point in time. This community can, can continue to be a special place and be conservative in the way that we're and thoughtful in the way it's developed or we can let this this tidal wave of development come through and wash us over and, and make us, I like to use the phrase, anywhere USA. Mm -hmm. I often say that I could take anybody and put a blindfold on them and put them on a plane and drop them anywhere in the US and take them to a neighborhood and they wouldn't have any idea what city they were in. They, they just wouldn't. 
there's a Target, there's a Walmart, there's a grocery store, there's drug stores, there's, it's the same thing. I do work all over the United States and mm -hmm. I go to communities and it's amazing to me, other than some nuances in architecture and geography, it's pretty much the same place, anywhere USA. So in my mind, how do we keep Belmont from becoming anywhere USA and instead keep its originality, keep its charm, and, and that goes back to what do we allow to be developed here and what do we not? So new jobs are coming, but with those new jobs and getting those, it starts with getting the companies here and companies want to go where their employees are or where their companies, where their employees will want to go and be. Mm -hmm. And so Belmont is a natural fit for that because it's an easy sell, especially to the new young talent like you guys. I mean, you, 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 we all gravitated here for a reason. And so getting the companies here is the next big thing. And you have to have office space. You have to have industrial space. You have to have uh, residential, uh, all different types of residential for the workers to be, to be here and want to be here. And, and those workers range from hourly employees to executives. And you have to provide a little bit for everybody. But I realized uh, I spent two and a half years on Belmont's Planning Zoning Board, and I did so when I was asked to do it. I did so, uh, um, I agreed pretty quickly. And I did so um, um, uh, openly and just shared if I do this, just please know I'm coming at this from a developer's perspective although a developer who loves the city of Belmont. And so I think it's important for a planning zoning board to have all different types of people from people not in the real estate business, from people who are in the real estate business to people who are just, just regular citizens who come from other industries so that you have a balanced sense of opinion. But one thing that kept holding true all through this time and watching this grow and watching this emerge was, how does Belmont set itself apart in a city, in a metro area of dozens and dozens of smaller communities. How does Belmont set itself apart? And the idea uh, over a beer with a couple of guys that grew up in Belmont one day six or seven years ago was, let's find something that makes us unique. There's other towns. Davidson has a liberal arts college. Davidson is on the lake. Davidson has a historic downtown. What sets Davidson apart? What makes Davidson special? Belmont has a liberal arts college. Belmont has uh, the lake. Belmont has the historic downtown. Why is Davidson, Davidson and Belmont is it's trying to figure out what its new identity is, what, what can separate it? And so we tossed around various ideas and one of the things that came up in that discussion was is, one of the differences in Davidson, which everybody would argue is a wonderful community in the metro area, one of the things that Davidson has that Belmont doesn't is their liberal arts college sits in the middle of town. Our liberal arts college, Belmont Abbey, is separated by two man-made barriers, I-85 and, and Highway 74. And those busy thoroughfares push the university away from downtown. And we would watch That's kids right. traversing the uh, uh, road bridge and the old rail bridge to come into town. And they shouldn't have to do that. It, it should be an easy walk, bike ride back and forth from campus to our downtown. And so as these ideas began to continue to get discussed, I thought back into time. Well, when we were trying to develop and create a brand in what is now South End, we thought, what can we do here to separate it? What can we do to bring people here and make it a special place that maybe is different than Plaza Midwood or Noda or Dilworth or all the other great neighborhoods in, in and around the urban center of Charlotte? Yeah. And Trolley came to mind. So I recall back in the 90s that we were developing the Atherton Mill. There were, um, uh, it was a hard sell. My job was to bring companies and people there to lease space, buy space, and it was a hard sell. And we were spending millions of dollars redeveloping these 13 acres. And one day dad said, I want you to come with me to Atherton Mill. There's something special going on today. 
And so I went and here comes a, a large 18 wheeler flatbed truck with an old beat up trolley car on the back of it. And they deposited it right in the middle of Atherton Mill. And I said, what in the world are we doing? We have our hands full restoring these, these seven old buildings. What are, we gonna do? what are we gonna do with this old train car? And dad said, you'll see. And so to, to fast forward, what happened was is there were some leaders in Charlotte, Dan Morrill, head of Historic Landmarks Commission, and some others who had found car number 85, the last car to run in Charlotte before it was displaced by rubber tire buses, city buses. The trolley cars came off the streets and the trolley uh, and the city buses replaced them. And so they had found this old car in Huntersville in the woods. Somebody was living in it. Huh. And the idea was there were railroad tracks directly behind Atherton Mill and Norfolk Southern would allow us to run for about a mile on those tracks because it was lightly used. And we would restore the car and we would put the car on the tracks and people could come on weekends and see this historic trolley car running on the tracks. And I thought to myself, well, that sounds fun, but I mean, how many people are really gonna come? So in its last year of operation, 150,000 people came to see that trolley car. And that's 150,000 people that ate at the restaurants, shopped at the shops at Atherton Mill, that ended up buying homes nearby, ended up opening businesses. I watched the economic growth that occurred by this little tiny train car. And so when I'm sitting with my friends, Ron Lovelace, Nate Wells, and others, we started thinking, wait a minute, there's a track that runs from downtown Belmont to Belmont Abbey that you never see a train on. Let's figure out what it is. Can we use it? Could we find a car that we could use to run on the track? Could we bring a trolley service to Belmont and connect the students to downtown, which may also create economic development activity for the city of Belmont. It may also give us a brand in addition to what we already have and make us unique. No other town in North Carolina has trolley service running in the middle of town. Absolutely. Why can't it be Belmont? Well, that was six years ago. And I think it, 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 that day, it, it was a grand idea. And I've realized as time has gone on, it is even better idea than we could have ever imagined. However, it is, it is a lot more work than any of us could have imagined. And uh, I, I, would, I, I would, there have been times in the last six years, if you ask any of us that have been involved, if we had it to do over, would we do this again? And I think everybody, if they were honest, at some point or another would say probably not, because it's been a huge undertaking, starting with who owns the tracks? Well, we found out the state of North Carolina they usually don't own tracks. Usually those tracks and those right-of-ways are owned by private railroad companies, CSX, Norfolk Southern, around here. They're owned by the state. So Adrian Miller, Ron Lovelace, Nate Wells, Rod Smallwood, all local guys, we get in a car and we drive to Raleigh to go meet with the North Carolina Department of Transportation Rail Division. I thought, they're gonna throw us out of here. But we set up a meeting, they agreed to meet with us, we went up to Raleigh, we met with them, we told them our idea, and shockingly they said, we think it's great. Wow. We would love to participate. How often does that don't? happen? Never, <laughs> never. And the bureaucracy of government itself, and then you throw in railroads, which is a, its own bureaucracy. So we, we left Raleigh and drove back to Belmont super excited because we have a track. Now we have a track. Now we need a trolley car. And then we started thinking about it. Well, if we have a trolley car, we got to have somewhere to put it. So we need a trolley barn. And so on the drive home, we realized if we were going to be successful, we had to have, among many other things, three things. And we've always referred to it as the three-legged stool. Tracks, train car, facility. And so in the next year, we spent a lot of our time working towards getting the three-legged stool put together. And so that was the genesis of how the, the trolley idea was born. But That's great. Um, over, and I can tell you all you want to know about where we stand with each one of the legs of the stool, but I will tell you that one of the things that's occurred as this has continued to mature and really become a reality is, is yes, we're going to be able to link Belmont Abbey to downtown Belmont. Um, and yes, 
not everybody believes it to the magnitude that I do because I saw it firsthand, but it's going to mean an incredible amount of economic development that will come to town. It will be a separate uh, branding opportunity for the city of Belmont. But we started thinking about it. You know, if we have a historic car, these trolley cars we found later used to run in, in Gaston County. They pushed textile workers back and forth between mills and neighborhoods they lived in. And so we started looking into the history of trolleys and trains and how important it was to the textile industry and started realizing this is not unique to Belmont or Gaston County. And so we started thinking, if we're gonna do all this, we need to be able to have a way to uh, share the history. And so we started thinking about the educational component of this. Could we build a facility that housed the car and then bring school kids on field trips to be able to see the cars and watch videos and look at pictures on the walls of the history of these cars and what they meant to this whole region as a whole. We thought, yeah. So all of a sudden now we've got an economic development component, we've got a branding opportunity, we've got a link to Belmont Abbey. Now we have a history and educational component, which was amazing. The last benefit that we've seen and, and recently began to discover is, is we started going through the design process of where we're going to house this car. Trolley cars don't have engines. Trolley cars have motor that have to have power that comes from a separate source. And if you've ever been to San Francisco or seen pictures of the San Francisco cars, the trolley cars that run in San Francisco, or you've seen any trolley cars, street cars had electrical service supplied to the car that ran the motor that made the car move. And it was with overhead wire. Right. And a large bracket would go up and it would touch the wire. And when it touched the wire, it would, it would send the electricity to the motor in the car. Well, we knew early on we, we could not take on the expense of electrifying the entire line. And, and in some discussions with the city, the city wasn't real keen on the idea of running electrical overhead wiring. And so we just, real quick, we realized that wasn't an option. In Charlotte, when the cars ran, it wasn't an option either. And so what they ended up doing was they created a diesel powered motor on a tandem car that would hook to the trolley that would provide the electricity. We started talking about that and recently we've had more discussions and we've even secured the parts and the components we need to do a tandem car. But we started realizing if you have a diesel power generator, you have to have uh, a place to store fuel. You have to deal with fuel. Fuel's dirty. Diesel fuel's really dirty. And we just didn't want to get into the liability, the logistics of constantly filling a tandem car with fuel. And so we started thinking, hey, battery. Batteries clean energy. It's it's the wave of the future. I mean, the automobile companies are quickly every, converting all every of their other cars car to is battery. going electric. The trolley car might as well. Sure. So why can't we have a historic trolley car with uh, and and a mini EV uh, tandem that could go with it and provide the power these motors and these cars need? And so we went down that road and we started realizing this is the way we're going to do this. And some things, again, serendip serendipitously happened. Uh, Piedmont Lithium is headquartered in Belmont. They supply lithium to Tesla. Then we realized we could go talk to them and consult with them maybe. Then we realized Nate Wells and our group figured out that UNCC, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, has an engineering school, and their engineering school has a whole group dedicated to clean energy for trains. I mean, of all the universities in the country, I mean, we've got one sitting here that is building and designing clean energy for train cars, the trains of the future. So we approached the school, the school loved what we were doing, and they saw it as a great opportunity to be an incubator for their program, to have access, full-time access to our trolleys and to our uh, electric uh, power vehicle that would push and pull these cars. And so last year we made a donation to the university and aligned ourselves with them. And they spent last semester designing our uh, uh, battery powered tandem car. Yeah. And this semester we've generated, we've raised more money and we've contributed it to the school and they're building the car. The batteries have already been delivered from California leaf batteries that will power this 
first generation tandem car. I love how even in that, what's going on with the cars, honoring the legacy, bringing the cars, putting them back on the tracks, but again, looking towards the future and what can be, putting these electric vehicles to pull the carts, it really does encompass what you mentioned as your philosophy and development, which is being thoughtful in how do you honor the past, but also look towards the future. And that car being pulled by an electric vehicle, it's just so fascinating to me that it's encompassed there. So now, fast forward, we have three trolley cars. They're going to be pulled by things that are developed by UNCC here locally. Piedmont Lithium happens to be in Belmont. All of these interests that are shared are moving it down the tracks, putting it on the tracks, and we're looking at building the facility. Where is it at now? In so addition we go back, to what you so, just mentioned, and sure. what's the ultimate vision? As so we, we go close? back to the three-legged stool. We have to have trolley, we have to have track, we have to have a facility. So you touched on the cars, yes. We now have three cars. And it, it pleases me to know in that um, Belmont Trolley, we approached the city of Charlotte. Those train cars, those trolley cars that ran at Atherton Mill back in the 90s, including the one that I saw pulled in in major disrepair onto Atherton Mill's property, is one of those cars. Wow. Adrian Miller and I went to Historic Landmarks uh, five years ago. Those cars were sitting idle. They had a plan. It was kind of a long distance plan for how they were gonna get the cars running in Charlotte again. And it was gonna be on the west side of town and, and it had a lot of hurdles associated with it. And we said, look, it's gonna be some years before you're able to get past all these uh, obstacles you have in running trolleys in Charlotte again. Might we borrow your cars, have them on loan and run them in Belmont while you're doing that, it will buy you time to complete your plan. It will buy us time to find a car for Belmont. And Adrian and I laugh today because uh, short of picking us up by our belts and throwing us out the front door of the Historic Landmarks Commission's boardroom, uh, we were asked, we were told politely, no and no thank you. We're not letting our cars leave Mecklenburg County. One particular car number 85 is very historic and unique to our community. And so Nate Wells, uh, our train enthusiast and board member who has the technical knowledge of trains, found a car in Canada. And it was a um, car that was in, in, in great condition. Uh, it was not operable, but we knew we could raise the money and make it operable. And so we raised the money and we bought the car from a museum in Canada, had it loaded on a flatbed truck, raised enough money to have that truck wrap it in, in saran wrap and drive it all the way from Canada to Belmont. And that was several years ago and, the, and the, the truck made its loop through town. And then we ultimately took it to the public works building which has a warehouse and had space that was available for us to put it in there and to restore it. Fast forward uh, several years later, the car is uh, cosmetically, we are very close to completing that car. We now call that car number 16. And so Belmont has its own car, car number 16. So fast forward about nine months ago, I got a call from the folks at Historic Landmarks Commission and the former Charlotte Trolley and said, the idea we had is apparently not going to work at this location and even worse, uh, the property's been sold that they're sitting in to a developer who's going to redevelop it and has no interest in these cars. We have no place to put these cars. We want to see them run again. We want to see them run as quickly as possible. And we've come to realize Belmont is part of our greater metro area. And it's not the end of the world to cross the county line. We're 11 miles from downtown. Right. And so would you guys be interested in taking these cars and taking them to Belmont? You're very far along in your plan and having a fleet of three vehicles. And of course, of course we would. Nobody up and down the East Coast, at least between DC and Florida, has three trolley cars. This is a big, big deal. There's only a handful of municipalities in the country that have a fleet of historic vintage trolley cars running. And so we've spent the last six months negotiating, came to terms, got leases together, perpetual leases, and raised the money. Once again, we've gone around and passed the hat and raised the money and paid $24,000 to have these cars picked up, loaded up in Charlotte, and brought to Belmont. 
and resituated car 16 in the public works building and set two more right beside it. So now we have three vintage trolley cars sitting in public works, each going through its own uh, form of restoration. Even the Charlotte cars, which are operable, needed cosmetic restorations and, and preparation for the electric tandem car that's going to be running it. So we now have three cars. We have car number 16, which is Belmont's car. We have car number 85, which was the last car to run in Charlotte. And we have car number one, which we call the Greek car. And there's a story behind it, and we'll tell it another day. But we now have three cars. Each is unique to itself. Car number 85 is the largest car. Car number one is the smallest car. And uh, our car um, uh, is the, the medium-sized car that, uh, when done, will have its own special color scheme for Belmont using the red that the town loves. And um, we're excited. So three-legged stool, track, check, trolley cars, check. Now we need a facility. And you ask, where's this facility gonna go? So over the last year, we raised money, we engaged the firm of CL Held, which is a Belmont-based architectural firm, to uh, design for us a six to 7,000 square foot building that would uh, be modern in nature and use, but it would uh, look like vintage train station. And so we researched and we looked at old train depots around the southeast and we they CL Health has come up with a conceptual design and I now have on my desk the architectural plans that are about 60% complete for this facility. We are still making tweaks about how it's going to operate and work, but uh, we are very close. And so you ask, where is this facility going to go? Well, in our discussions with North Carolina Department of Transportation, it made most sense for us. It had to be at, on the line somewhere. And the good news was, at the very end of the line in downtown Belmont, there's a piece of land that sits behind a public parking lot that the city leases from DOT that's on Glenway Street. And it's also next to the new Piedmont Mont Lithium headquarters. It's also next to the new Chronicle Mill major makeover. And it sits in downtown. So it's, and it's got a Perfect. parking lot out in front of it. So it's, it's, it's like things do come true. I mean, dreams do, do come true if you work hard. And the, the state has verbally agreed to allow us to sign a land lease, a long-term land lease. So we're gonna work in conjunction with the city of Belmont, North Carolina Department of Transportation, and Belmont Trolley Incorporated to do a tri-party agreement. Our plan is to raise the money, build this facility that would house all three trolley cars, and once complete, we will donate the facility to the city of Belmont and have a perpetual lease back for a dollar a year. Those terms are still being worked out. Belmont Trolley Incorporated will operate the facility. The city of Belmont will own the facility. It's our gift to the city of Belmont because the trolley facility will not only house the trolley cars, but it will be a 6,000 square foot downtown Belmont event venue. It's being designed that the cars can be pulled out of the end of the building and it's open space that will have catering kitchen in it. It'll have our educational components, our museum components in it. We envision Saturday morning farmers markets. We envision corporate events. We envision civic events. We envision weddings. And so this will be the much needed event venue in downtown Belmont that's controlled by Belmont Trolley and City of Belmont. There's one more key component to all this. Belmont, in tandem with Belmont Trolley, concurrent to each other, have been working on a thread trail that will run through the city of Belmont into Belmont Abbey. So now the connection that we were using with the trolleys to Belmont Abbey is now paired with a pedestrian connection that will be a beautifully landscaped and well-lit jogging and walking path where we envision students coming back and forth to town, families taking their strollers, their mountain bikes, and walking through town on a Saturday afternoon, and it weaves itself all through historic downtown Belmont. Parallel with the track. That and is so this, this thread trail needs, 
the head of the thread trail. If you live in Belmont, but you don't live in downtown and you want to go for a walk on a Saturday afternoon or a Tuesday afternoon, you need a place to park. And so there's a public parking lot sitting right in front of it, a Belmont public parking lot. So you conceivably could drive from Reflection Point to downtown, park your car, have lunch, and then walk along the thread trail. And, and so we're designing the building in a way that has men's and women's public restrooms that have exterior entrances and interior entrances so that there's water fountain and restrooms at the head of the thread trail that even when the facility might not be open, the restrooms would be open for public use. And so we've created something, as you can see, this idea born over a beer sitting in Belmont <laughs> of connecting downtown to Belmont Abbey has grown and has blossomed into this amazing civic experience that will, when done, uh, I believe, be a huge economic generator. It Absolutely. will be an amazing history exercise for our community. Uh, helping keep alive the textile industry and how, how Belmont was born and um, uh, so many other benefits that our community will have. Absolutely. And, and, and this is being done, this is being done, Belmont has, uh, Belmont and some of the other public entities have made some contributions to the project, but, but the majority of the money, I would say that uh, 90, 90 to 95% of the money for this project is all by private donation. This is not a government-sponsored program, even though one of the biggest beneficiaries of this is the city of Belmont right. and having an event facility, a branding idea, as well as an economic generator. But this will be something that will live on for decades and decades to come. And in my opinion, Belmont, among the many other attributes, will also be known as the town with the trains, the Absolutely. town with the trolleys. Absolutely. It sets it apart and it adds to that unique feel of Belmont, but it's not off-brand. It really yeah. fits with that brand, again, of honoring the legacy, but looking forward. And when I think of building Belmont, the podcast, and what we're building here, this is a, it represents the heart of what we're trying to capture is exactly that, what is happening, how how is it happening and why is it happening? Right. So thank you for all that you've done. What year can we be looking forward to these trains on the track? Well, I hope uh, at this point we have, we have a lot of money to raise. This building is not gonna be inexpensive. Um, we still need to um, finish re restoring the three cars. Um, we have, uh, we've raised to date about $600,000. Um, we've got probably 175,000 in the bank that much of that's earmarked for restoration and the tandem car construction that's going on at UNCC this year. But uh, we'll need to raise 100% of the cost of the barn. We'll also need to um, raise enough money so that we have a uh, fund or an endowment, if you will, so that um, this um, Belmont Trolley Incorporated can live in perpetuity and future generations can enjoy it. Um, however, we have a mechanism to fund operations on an annual basis, not only through fund additional fundraising, but through events at the facility. Um, so with that said, our timeline is we need to raise about $3 million. And we have, we have uh, started, uh, we're pretty far along in preparation with our capital campaign. We're going to be reaching out to local businesses. We're going to be reaching out to um, uh, folks across, this is a Gaston County experience. It's in Belmont, but at the end of the day, this benefits the entire county. And so Absolutely. we're reaching out to business owners, we're reaching out to the public, we're reaching out to, for grants. Uh, we, are, we are looking anywhere we can find to raise money and raise donations. And we've had some, um, we've had some success. We've had some um, recently discussions with some folks that could get us pretty far along in that uh, and they're looking at us to match whatever they they put into the to the deal we will be successful but assuming Absolutely. that we raise the money that we need to raise by the end of 2022 we'd like to start construction next year i mean i'd love to tell you we're going to start construction this year but i think we still have a lot to do and i don't want to do this it's not how fast we can do it it's how well we can do it and so i would like to think that next year we'll have the facility built I really believe that we'll probably bring one of the cars in 2022 out to the site, probably erect a temporary metal building to house it in so that we can start uh, test driving the, the tandem car, which will be complete this summer. 
and get a car on the track so people can see what we're doing. It's, yeah. it's hard to sell something when it's hidden behind a curtain. Absolutely. And uh, we want to get it out, of, at least one car out of public work, get it out on the tracks. And so I, I, I think that the community of Belmont is going to start hearing a whole lot about Trolley from this point forward, particularly this spring when we embark on our capital campaign. And uh, I, I would like, our goal is, is not only to raise the money we need, but to get it from everybody for everybody to realize how big of a deal this is for Belmont, for every business in downtown Belmont who will benefit from this to contribute something. Yes. For, for mom and pop, school kids, for big corporations, for everyone to contribute to this cause so that they feel like they were a part of yeah. Well, I think there's a sense of pride that will come with that. Sure. And I'm, I'm believing as well that this podcast and our platform will help to support that and driving awareness and showing. I know that, Zach, I was thinking about some of the B-roll that we're going to have of these cars as Rob was talking about them. So I'm excited about what's going to come from that. Thank you so much for your time. This is one conversation of what will be many. We'll, we'd love to have you back on to give love updates to on the trolley. And then, of course, the other projects that you're a part of. So thank you for what you've done to build Belmont. And thank you for the time and, again, your heart for legacy and honor honoring what was while looking forward to what can be. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you again for joining us on the Building Belmont podcast. What do you think about the Belmont Trolley Project? The trolley, the trail, the event center. I, for one, am personally very excited about all aspects of this project. Are you imagining a beautiful afternoon with your family or with your loved ones, riding the trolley in and out of downtown or just walking on the trail, enjoying the trail. I know that I, for one, will be so excited to bring family and friends that are visiting to experience downtown and specifically the trolley. So let us know what you think. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube, rate and review and share with a friend. I'm your host, Keanu Trujillo with the Building Belmont Podcast. We'll see you next week.